Welcome to our webinar tonight, Med School Insights, Succeeding on Clinical Rotations. So uh, my name is Jeannie Gribben, uh, and it's such a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Medical School Tutoring here at Med School Coach. Um, you might have heard us uh, speaking before you came on the webinar, but I am um, currently in New York City. I um, am in internal medicine. I did my med school at uh, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and my residency at Weill Cornell. Um, I've been a tutor with Med School Coach since 2018, um, and I still continue to tutor um, on an active basis for step one, step two, step three, and shelf exams. Um, it is one of my favorite things to do, um, and I really look forward to continuing uh, in both the tutor role, the coaching role, and, and more of an advisor role. And I will pass it over to Dr. Hanna Vinitsky. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see y'all. Uh, my name is Hanna Vinitsky. Uh, I'm a graduate from Midwestern University in Arizona. Um, I'm currently a PGY2 neurology resident at NYU. Uh, and I've been tutoring with med school coach since 2019, I believe. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel. I'm a PGY2 interventional radiology resident in Northwell in New York. Um, also, kind of, if you heard us talking about it earlier, I'm a New York lifer, so went to undergrad and medical school in New York as well. Uh, I've been with med school coach ever since I was a third year medical student and took my, you know, finished up with my part one of my boards and we've just been working with them um, and with students through them ever since. So, um, kind of happy to play the role of master tutor and now advisor for anyone interested in radiology residency. Wonderful. And thank you for joining us. All right. So our agenda for today, um, we will talk about succeeding on your rotations. We'll talk about learning on the wards, studying for your clinical rotations, which of course, as you know, um, is, is quite different from studying for our preclinical tests, our um, boards exams, We'll talk about our favorite resources. We'll talk about sub-internships and how those differ from clerkships. And then we'll wrap up by talking about um, how we can help you here at Med School Coach, um, as well as the Q&A. All right, let's begin. Uh, I, get, I can start on this slide. Um, so ways to succeed on your rotation. I think the biggest thing really is just being enthusiastic. Um, nobody ever expects that, you know, every specialty is a specialty that you plan on doing for life, but every specialty has something that you can learn that's going to be helpful to the specialty that you choose to, um, apply to for residency. Um, it's always good to show up early and, uh, leave on the later side because you, you get to see the whole spectrum of how the day goes. Um, you get to help early in the morning and in the evening you can help your attending or your residents like get out on the earlier side if you're, you know, there to help with anything that you can. Um, and being helpful, I think, is one of the best things you can do, even if it's just obtaining uh, MRI consent forms, if it's uh, getting supplies for a procedure, um, helping out during a procedure. It's all helpful things that your attending and residents will appreciate. Um, it's okay not to know things. Nobody expects that you're a fully fledged attending um, when you're on a rotation, but it is good that when there's something you don't know, you go home, you read up on it, and the next day you can even suggest to your uh, team, could I present on the, the things that I didn't know yesterday to show you that I've learned something and maybe even teach you guys something that you didn't know, because we're always trying to learn more. Yeah, I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. I feel like a lot of the times the the best students are not necessarily the people that can recite the most facts. It's just the people that are the most eager to help and are the most enthusiastic to learn about when, when they're being taught by someone on the team. So um, I think those are probably the most important things to, to think about. You know, it's not just about, don't, don't, don't focus on memorizing every fact in, in the textbook. You know, that's, that's not what we're looking for when we're, you know, evaluating students, for example, for their rotations. Mm -hmm. My favorite Thanks. medical student. Oh, sorry. Go on, Jeannie. Oh, go ahead, Hannah. Uh, just my favorite medical students are the ones who are just excited about everything that we're doing and um, eager to teach me the things I don't know because there's so much I don't know. Yeah. 
Exactly. And I was going to say, you know, it's like attitude, 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 attitude is everything, just eagerness, excitement. Um, you know, even if let's say you want to go into OBGYN, but you're on your, you know, vascular surgery rotation, right? There is so much to learn. And, and it really is such a valuable experience, right? These are, these are clinical experiences that you will have that you will never have again, right? Depending on the specialty you go into. So um, that eagerness, that enthusiasm really is palpable. And, you know, like, like Hannah said, it takes a village, right? Like it really takes um, so much effort and all hands on deck to care for these patients. And so um, even if it's a patient that you're not quite following uh, yourself, right? Just being helpful to the entire team, um, helping with tasks, asking how can I offload things? How can I support? Um, because it really is, you know, essentially in every specialty, it's it's a team-based specialty. Absolutely. However, we are on rotations to learn. Obviously, as a third-year medical student, it's your first time being exposed to the clinical practice of medicine um, from, you know, from as, as a student. So, um, you know, we do need to learn material. And so there's a lot of opportunities and I wanted to discuss those with you. So first and foremost, you know, reading about the pathology that you see on a daily basis, I feel like that's a, such a such a critical thing. You know, every day you're going to take care of a couple of patients, depending on what rotation you're on, sometimes many more than a couple, sometimes just one or two. Um, and those patients come to you with, with a problem. And those problems are the exact type of problems that you're going to see in the books that you read and the question banks that you're doing. So, you know, read up, reading up about the, you know, a patient with COPD when they come in with the COPD exacerbation, it's a great opportunity to like see it in the flesh. You know, how am I, um, you know, admitting this person, working them up, managing them, what's the discharge plan, you know, and, and kind of understanding that whole process is also going to make it a lot easier for you to remember it versus just kind of trying to remember COPD without having that living, breathing example. Um, the next thing is obviously presenting, you know, and in the beginning presentations are really hard, you know, I have to think about, you know, uh, to capturing all this information from the EMR and from your physical exam and presenting it in a way that's comprehensive, but concise, but at the same time, you know, you want to try to push yourself, right? And once you get the hang of the present presenting the subjective and objective components, try to push yourself to come up with a plan because that's what doctors do, right? Doctors don't just kind of assess the situation. They also kind of kind of build the narrative of what the plan is going to be for that patient for the next day or for their discharge. Um, tons of opportunities to learn uh, during conference. So depending on the program or hospital, you're going to have conference either in the morning or at noon or sometimes at night, you know, be present at those conferences. Those are people that are either you know, attendings, chairs, you know, chief of departments, they're giving lectures on their topics that they are, have expertise in. And they're, you know, those are great opportunities to learn. Almost all the conferences that I've been to as a medical student were boards relevant. Like they were almost always relevant in some way to the exams that, you know, we all have to take. So, you know, they're not like, you know, they're not too advanced if, if you know what I mean? Um, other thing is flashcards. So I love, I love, I love, um, I love the doing flashcards during my downtime um, as a medical student because you know I think flashcards are just a great tool to practice information. And a lot of times as a medical student, there will be times where you're just kind of watching your residents do their progress notes, or they're kind of doing something, and you're, you know you're not necessarily directly actively involved in that particular moment. And it's a good opportunity to just you know be productive with the downtime. Uh, the last thing is, you know, never say no to an opportunity to learn a technical skill. I'm a little bit biased. I'm an interventional radiology resident. And so I jumped at every opportunity to put in central lines or IVs or anything like that. And I know a lot of people that, you know, it's not going to necessarily be your flavor of choice of, of medical practice. So it's fine. But, you know, those skills are valuable nonetheless, no matter what specialty you, you go into. So, uh, you know, just, you know, take take the opportunity to learn while, you know, while you're in the position of the learner before you're in the position of where you're being expected to actually do those things. Yeah, I I want to add on that was all great points, Daniel. Um, I just want to add on like the the using your downtime in the most efficient way possible is just a great way to succeed. It helps you with boards. It helps you with shelf or comat exams. Um, it it's just you know it it's a way for you to go home and get to relax a little bit instead of having to study when you get home or maybe minimizing the amount of time you study when you're home. Um, it also you know could benefit you on rotations where, hey, I just saw this year old question. And now I can say a little bit more about COPD, for example. Um, or actually, now that I see this year old question, I see that like what we do in real life practice is a little bit different from what happens on the exam, which is something to take into consideration. 
Um, and practicing the technical skills is so important as well. Like um, I'm a neurologist. We don't really do all that much apart from LPs, but sometimes you need an ultrasound and guided IV in someone. And I'm glad that I got the opportunity um, to practice that when I was in medical school and as a resident. Absolutely. And Daniel and Hannah will both talk a little bit more about studying um, over the next couple of slides. But I think, you know, what this shows, and I think it goes without saying, is that just the entire approach to learning when you're in your clinical rotations really is different from the experiences that you had prior to um, your clinical time, right? In preclinical years, even prior to that, right? College, uh, med school, uh, early in med school, even back to high school, we're often used to having, you know, prolonged, dedicated blocks of time to sit down and study, right, to do dozens and dozens of practice questions in a row or to read a whole textbook chapter all at once. And um, the learning on the wards is, is really a little bit more of a... Um, a matter of balancing, right? A matter of balancing the traditional types of learning with the traditional resources that we'll talk about shortly with, um, with the requirements and expectations on your day-to-day, -day, which quite frankly, aren't very predictable, right? Oftentimes, I think, you know, Daniel Hanna can also speak to this. Um, when you're rotating as a med student, you, you know what, you know, the morning rounds might look like and the couple hours after that, and then who knows what the rest of the day is going to look like, who knows what types of cases are going to roll in, what types of admissions. So, you know, some days you might have, you know, a, a ton of downtime. Other days you might be running around like a chicken without a head. And so just figuring out um, how to balance uh, your, your studying in that time and also just accepting, right, that this is going to be a little bit of a different experience and that, um, you know, I'm not necessarily going to have the time every day to come home and do 20 questions, 20 practice questions or 40 practice questions, right? Maybe it's, you know, five on my commute in the morning and five during my lunch break and five during my downtime and five when I get home in the evening. And that certainly adds up to 20, but it's totally a, a difference and a shift in, in sort of the, the way that we, that we gather the information um, and the approach that we take. Uh, so that brings us to the next slide of how to study during a clinical rotation. And it really is about, you know, one, being very efficient and maximizing it. And two, like Jeannie said, kind of recognizing that this is just a different way to learn. Um, this is not going to be someone handing you slides and telling you, well, this is how COPD presents. It's going to be you more actively saying, oh, this is how my patient is presenting. Let me look into the classic presentation so that when something more atypical comes up, you can say, oh, well, I know how this presents classically and this has similar features to it. Um, I personally like to make sure that I had all of my QBank questions related to my shelf or comat done before the comat, because that way I had seen a little bit of everything, especially if it wasn't something that I saw in my rotation. Um, so it gave me exposure to everything that I might be tested on. Um, also, like Jeannie said, like breaking it down into something manageable, like sitting down and doing 120 questions in a day is not really realistic, um, but maybe trying to look at how many questions you have total and dividing it by the number of days you have to study um, and seeing if that's something a little bit more digestible uh, is a good idea. And it also helps you schedule out your day. So maybe you could have a free weekend or a free night. Um, you can accommodate for a very busy day where you're running around nonstop. Um, you know, giving yourself a little bit of slack that you're a human being who's tired, who just finished step in level one and went right into rotations. And sometimes you need a little bit of a break. Um, what's important is sometimes, you know, I would find that there was something that I learned from you world that I would present to my residents and they'd say, well, we don't really do that in real life. Um, so make sure that the things you learn on your rotation are actually also being tested on the exams, because sometimes the exams are a couple of years behind, um, maybe a year or two behind. Uh, so, you know, when you get a question and you answer it the way that you learned on rotations and it says it's wrong, you kind of have to balance the two in your head of what matters for the exam versus what, what we're actually doing clinically. And I really liked watching the OME uh, online med ed videos before I started because it gave me some exposure to what I was walking into. My school, for example, did a cardiology rotation that was mandatory. I'd never done cardiology and I didn't want to walk in completely blind. So it was nice to have a little bit of background to know what I was walking into, to, to know some basics and to be able to impress a little bit with that. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, um, piggybacking off of what Hannah was saying, um, sort of like we were saying before, we're used to, prior to our clinical years, we're used to doing practice questions that test 
knowledge that we've already learned, whether it's in a lecture or by watching videos or reading a textbook. And you'll find that when you start clinical rotations, this is brand new knowledge, right? This is some of this is, is stuff that you have never seen before. And that was not tested on step one or level one. Um, things like, you know, I'm trying to remember some of my, you know, like fetal heart tracings, which you probably don't even know what I'm talking about, but you will. Um, and these are things that are going to be brand new to you on your clinical rotations. And so um, I think that really underscores um, the value of getting your feet wet a little bit beforehand, whether it's watching videos, starting some flashcards, starting some questions, and then also really reframing and shifting our approach to questions, right? Our, our question break banks, whether it's UWorld and or TrueLearn, are not, not necessarily going to be review questions, right? They're going to be questions that help to frame our learning. And all of these question banks, have extensive amounts of explanations. And those explanations are sort of like a textbook of information disguised in question format. And so I think giving ourselves grace, like we had said, to just accept that, you know, some of this is brand new to us. And so certainly we're going to get that question wrong, or we're certainly going to be taking a guess, but then figuring out from the answer explanation, how are we going to now sort of download and save this and apply this moving forward? Piggybacking off of all of that, and I think all of that is amazing advice. And I just want to preface this by saying that I don't I don't know that there's one supreme you know way to go about studying as an MS3. I think all of these resources are great, and I think everybody's going to find a different one that suits them you know better and for different learning styles. But some of the resources that I loved uh, when I was a third year was Sports and Beyond. So this was now far more developed uh, as a series than it, than it was when I was using it. Uh, I think when I was using it, I was actually the first edition that ever came out for third year medical students because it was primarily a preclinical resource. Um, now it's basically a very complete resource for third year medical students. And I think it's amazing. I love, I love just having one place that has everything. And so there really isn't anything like that, I think. Uh, I think online meta was was really was like was that um kind of version and then now boards and beyond is like maybe a, a newer version I'm not sure but I really love the idea of just having one resource that had lectures on every topic you know instead of having to like find things all over the place um I love divine intervention podcast it's a little bit less organized but it's really nice for those of us that do long commutes or do any activity where they can't necessarily be watching a video but they could be listening to something like uh, exercising, chores, etc. So I thought that was really good for reviewing material. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a flashcard junkie. Uh, I think flashcards are a phenomenal way to, you know, rehearse the knowledge that you work so hard to 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 learn. So Anki is, you know, by far, in my opinion, the the single most effective uh, memory retention tool that's ever existed. And I think everybody should try to use it at least. I know it's not for everyone, but everyone should give it a try. Um, and I think it's a great way, like I said, you know, we spend a lot of hours learning information and then, you know, you, you know, it's kind of not really helpful unless you retain it and are able to recall it. So I think Anki is a great way to bridge that. And then finally, Amboss, I mean, I think UWorld has historically always been the gold standard question bank. Um, and I think it still is, but I think if you're looking for like a second best that really does mimic USMLE step two questions, um, Amboss is going to be it. And I think Amboss is really nice because it's both the question bank and obviously it has explanations, but it also has a whole content library. So for those of us out there that learn better by reading, there's like endless amounts of articles on every single topic that the questions have. And it's very, very beautifully integrated um, and very user-friendly. So I think Amboss is a, definitely a, a question bank worth taking a look at as well. Uh, I'm actually totally with Daniel. I forgot to put Amboss on here, but Amboss is amazing, especially because with step two, level two, you, step one, level one, we have our gold standard resources. You know, it's doing UWorld, it's using um, first aid, Pathoma, Sketchy, all that kind of stuff. And step two, level two is a little bit more, um, you have to understand why you're doing something rather than just memorize rote facts. 
Um, so I think Amboss like really does a great job of not having you jump all over the place with Google to try to figure out or understand something. It's all in one concrete place, which is wonderful. Um, it saves you a lot of time. And the Amboss questions really are representative of the exam. Um, I remember seeing this weird H&P question on Amboss and I was like, I'm not even going to touch this. This is too long. I don't want to deal with it. First question on my step two was literally that same format. And I was like, I should have paid more attention to Amboss and trusted that they knew what was going on. Um, for me, I do love online meta. I really liked um, knowing as much as I could before I went into a rotation. So kind of like Jeannie said, you don't walk into OBGYN and go, what's a fetal heart tracing? Um, it made me more comfortable to go in having a base knowledge um, and made me feel like I could excel a little bit better that way and improve on more specifics rather than learning for the first time what something is. Um, I also love Anki. I think space repetition is so important. And um, I don't think it's the end goal. I think space repetition is sometimes you just have to know facts in order to understand. Um, so I always like to start with Anki, learn the facts I needed to know, and then apply it through questions. Um, because there are just some questions you can't answer unless you know the base first order knowledge. Um, I also love UWorld. Um, I loved Amboss. I love TrueLearn. I just love doing questions. And I think what's really important for step two level two is that you don't pin your self-worth on the percent correct. I know a lot of us have a hard time with that. We're all overachievers who want 100% on everything. But um, step two level two is a little bit more about understanding why you're doing something. And that's how you learn through the questions. For example, why would you get an x-ray over an MRI over a CAT scan? Um, when you take the exam, it's going to be situations you've never seen before, and you have to understand the reasoning behind diagnostic testing, behind um, clinical diagnoses, behind um, treatments. Unlike step one, level one, where it's a little more, do you know this fact? Do you know this fact? Do you know this medication um, mechanism of action? Great. And and I think just to um, add to all this uh, really important um, messaging is two things. So I think you've probably heard now, you've heard a lot of different resources that have been named. Um, and I think there, there are just two points I want to make. The first is that these resources fall under sort of different categories, right? You've heard the term spaced repetition. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard that term before, what it basically means is that you have repetitive information that is spaced over time. So, you know, if today is October 17th and my shelf exam is December 31st, and I learned something new today, right? I need to figure out a way to make sure that I am continuously um, reintroduced to that information in a serial or periodic fashion from now all the way through December 31st. And that's the idea of spaced repetition. So spaced repetition is encapsulated by things like Anki. Um, Anki builds in spaced repetition for you, but certainly for those of you who might not like to use Anki or might not like to use flashcards, there are other ways to incorporate spaced repetition utilizing your other resources. Of course, there are question banks, right? Question banks, it's its own sort of category of resources. So whether it's UWorld and or TrueLearn and or Amboss, um, and then lastly, I would say sort of reference guides or reference resources for content. And so those are things like videos, online med ed, which can teach you things. Um, as Daniel said, if you're more of a reader, right, their Amboss has, you know, wonderful, um, uh, essentially sections of information, like basically mini textbooks of information. Um, so that's where you can get sort of your foundational content and foundational concepts. Um, so think about your resources in a way that makes sure that you're hitting each of those different buckets. Um, and then all to say, and I think Daniel and Hannah would agree with me, sometimes less is more, right? We are not in the business of needing to do every single true learn question, every single U world, every single AMBOSS, right? You want to basically use these resources in an individualized and personalized way. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to our approach at the end. But that's, I think, what's, you know, what I find to be so valuable about working with students as a tutor is figuring out, you know, yes, every single person on this webinar will probably have UWorld at some point, but how we use UWorld and how we um, engage with the answer explanations and how we make our question banks, right? It's going to look different for everybody. So just figuring out um, what works for you uh, and basically being sure that you're using your resources in a way that's, that's thorough, um, 
and dedicated and really thoughtful um, rather than having your hand sort of superficially in a bunch of different resources and not really using them to your advantage. All right, so let's talk about some sub-internships. So this, this is like a topic more relevant, I think, to uh, fourth-year medical students. So I think, firstly, let's define what a sub-internship is. I think a lot, not a lot of people as early third-year medical students may be familiar with the term. So you may have heard of the term away rotation, sub-internship, acting internship, sub-I. All these terms are synonymous with basically a fourth year elective rotation in the specialty that you plan on applying into. Um, and essentially, a lot of the times this can be either at your home hospital or program, but this can also be at another institution or program that you want to go to or that you just want to learn more about. So, for example, um, for my as a fourth year medical student, I did three interventional radiology sub internships at three uh, programs, one of them being the one that I actually ended up matching at. And basically, this is an opportunity to do, again, a rotation that is, you know, the one that you want to go into, the specialty that you want to go into. Um, and it also gives you the opportunity to, you know, learn about a new place, right? And you like work with new people and see if it's a good fit for you for the, while you train for the next three to seven years, depending on how long, you know, your residency is. Um, and I think the standard is just a little bit different for sub eyes. You know, obviously you're not a third year medical student anymore, right? So that's the first thing you're the, the baseline level of knowledge um, and ownership of the patient is definitely a little bit higher. Second of all, you know, if you're coming from an outside institution, um, you know, you're, you're an outsider trying to showcase your talent to, to get in. So, you know, there's, you know, the people are going to be um, maybe not critical, but, you know, they're going to be watching you and they're going to be wanting to see that you're doing a good job uh, because that's doing a good job is what gets you, you know, your foot in the door at that institution. Uh, the final thing is, is that the enthusiasm really should be at a completely other level because now instead of doing a rotation that you're forced to do, you're doing a rotation that you love to do and that you want to do for the rest of your life, right? So now you really should be, um, you know, you should be the most excited person in the room. Let's just put it that way. Like the sub I, you know what I mean? My, my favorite thing is like if a sub I would, like, I mean, sometimes I'll give them my number because we're working on the same team. And if they text me about the cases and they're like, oh my God, I cannot wait to do this case tomorrow. I hope you're in the same room as me. Like, this is so exciting. I've only like read about this. You know what I mean? That is like such an amazing feeling, you know, so you, know, you should be the most excited person in the room. Uh, you should also, you know, be for sure, you know, the early and late mantra kind of uh, is, is, is just kind of really, really important here, especially for procedural or surgical fields where there is a lot of stuff to do before the shift starts. And there almost always is a lot of things to do when the traditional quote unquote day ends um, in terms of getting things, you know, wrapped up. So you should be, you know, time, you know, you should be punctual, but you should also be ready for the days to go late. And honestly, my advice to anyone going in, especially for, you know, people going into more arduous, again, procedural, surgical types of specialties or any sort of specialty that is, has a lot of demanding hours, like, um, that are not predictable, that are not like kind of shift based, um, you know, is just to be 100%, 120% committed to that and nothing else because if you have I feel like if you have anything else distracting you it might hinder your ability to be 100% present and and showcase your best ability um of course especially if you're at a new institution where people may not know you you want to be friendly to everyone and this is a piece of advice that I was told really early on and I I really did not understand it maybe as like an early third year medical student but now, being on the other side of things, I totally, totally resonate with this, like how you interact with every single person, whether it is a nurse, a tech uh, supervisor, manager, you know, any staff that even if whether they're physicians or not, can make, a, can make or break you. That's, that's really the bottom line. They can, they can, you know, good things spread and bad thing, bad things spread. And, you know, you want to treat everyone with respect and you want to treat everyone as a potential future teammate, because that's honestly what they are. So just be aware of that. And don't think that there's any, first of all, don't think that there's any task that's like beneath you, you're there to help and, and any task that you can do that will improve the efficiency of the team is a task that you should say yes, happily to. And at the same time, don't think that there's any, there's any person that, you know, you, you know, you're not like you should be engaging with everyone in a respectful way. 
Lastly, is asking for feedback. So I'm a big, big proponent. And this, this is this is not just for sub I think this is fair game for any rotation that you're on. Um, I think it's totally reasonable to sit down with the clerkship director or the program director, whoever it is that you kind of report to and ask them for feedback at the halfway point. And then again, at the end, and just to see, you know, first of all, it's a good opportunity to network with that person, um, show your face, show your name, say that you're interested, say that you exist, you know, it kind of puts, you know, it's so much easier if you ask for a letter of rec or if you ask to get involved in research uh, or if you need anything at all in the future you sat in that person's office, you've interacted with them, you're able to now leverage that opportunity to hopefully, you know, make it easier for them to remember who you are and connect you with whatever resource you're asking for, right? Or write a more strong letter for you. Uh, so I think that, I mean, I think that's just good practice. And, you know, um, you know, the, you know, what's the worst that could happen is that they, they say they're too busy. I mean, most of the time, it's almost always very easy to find five or 10 minutes to sit down with someone and get feedback express interest, express what you're, you know, what's going well, what isn't, and then, you know, be on your merry way. So I think those are some things to keep in mind for fourth year. Yeah, just to add on, I think uh, asking for feedback is something that never ends. Um, still at, in residency, I'm always asking for feedback because there's always something to improve on. Um, I think as a sub I, it's always nice to give a heads up. I would like feedback in the future if you could like sit and think about some things. And if you ask for it at the halfway point, it's something actionable that you can actively improve on. And it looks good that you've you know, modified your um, history, your physical exam, what you're doing based on the feedback you've been given, because it shows that you're someone who is thoughtful um, and will improve with the feedback. Um, I also cannot like emphasize how important it is to just be approachable and friendly. Um, my favorite medical students aren't the ones who know everything um, and can manage a patient on their own. They're the ones who I, I want to hang out with. I want as a teammate in the future. Um, you've made it this far. You're an intelligent person. I don't doubt that. But I do want a, a teammate who I feel I can rely on in residency, which is such a difficult period of time. Um, so if you're excited about what you're doing, um, you're friendly, um, I feel like I can rely on you. That's always a great sign for someone that I would want as a teammate in residency. Absolutely. You know, the, the old saying, people won't necessarily remember what you say, but they will remember how you made them feel. And I feel like that quote just entirely <laughs> encapsulates the whole experience of clinical rotations, right? Um, People, your your those who are evaluating you, your your residents, your chief residents, your attendings, they they might not remember the details of the presentation that you gave, but they will absolutely remember if you were eager, if you were engaged, if you were enthusiastic, if you offered to help with things. Um, so just keep that in mind, because um, we're all human here, and uh, and as we've been talking about, right, this is entirely a, a team based approach, um, really for the rest of your life, no matter what specialty you go into. All right, so we'll spend the next couple of minutes talking a little bit about Med School Coach, and then we have some wonderful questions coming in. Um, feel free, like I said, to um, give some questions in the Q&A section, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so essentially, you know, uh, what is Med School Coach and how can we help you? And I think um, there are a couple of things I want to emphasize here. Uh, the first is that um, Med School Coach uh, really prides itself on being an individualized and personalized support system for students at any stage of the game through the pre-med process, through the medical school process, and beyond. Um, we do not have our own curriculum. We do not have our own videos. Our goal is really to meet each and every student where he or she is at. Um, we pride ourselves on getting to know our students, on understanding their strengths, the uh, the ways in which they learn. Um, and so each tutor is, is paired with students um, so that we can build on all of these uh, different aspects that we'll speak about, but in a way that um, is, is really personalized and individualized. And, and I think um, that is so important, especially when you're in medical school, which involves right such an intense period of time of learning and growth and change. And so some of the areas that we focus on, um, of course, building our foundational concepts and our foundational knowledge. So helping to support um, the foundational knowledge that you yourself have developed through your preclinical years, um, figuring out are there any um, holes or gaps that we need to augment um, and figuring out what are sort of the strengths that we can then build at and how can we anticipate um, 
the, the sort of additional layers of knowledge that you'll be needing moving forward. Um, you've heard a lot today about planning, 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 especially when time is limited, as it often is in rotations, and when time might be unpredictable, as it often is. And so um, I think all of us work with our students very, very closely and longitudinally to build out plans, build out study schedules, um, keep ourselves accountable, and figure out the best way to maximize all of our time, even when we don't have so much of it. Um, we talked about practice questions, and we have some great questions coming in about uh, question banks we'll get to in just a moment. We talked about spaced repetition, and then, of course, getting ourselves to the testing point. Um, but what I want to emphasize here, especially in this webinar today, is that you know the, the value of the clinical rotations is, is really not captured exclusively by the shelf exam, right? So much is about your experience on the wards, your contributions to the teams, your evaluations by your other teammates, so your residents and your attendings. And so while testing is technically at the top of this pyramid, I would say, you know, what's either, either at the top or the bottom, depending on how you look at it, is really just who you are as a teammate, as a team member, um, and how you contribute to your patients and patient care. So like I said, I said the word personalized probably 30 times, but I'll say it a 31st time. So personalized, personalized, personalized. I can't emphasize that enough, especially because we all come from different medical schools with different curricula and different expectations. Um, we have gone through it ourselves, right? So we've all gone through the med school process um, and we understand what you are going through and can really um, sort of meet you where you're at. I always like to emphasize that, yes, we are, you know, we call ourselves tutors, but I really view it as, as a much more all-encompassing role. Um, we strive to coach you and to support you in a, in a holistic way. And so oftentimes that is beyond the content, that's beyond um, questions and explanations, and that really is about um, taking a look at, at what your needs are in each and every rotation and building um, a support system around that. Um, we have a lot of experience in this area, um, and we uh, certainly have um, incredible success in, um, in supporting students in, in all different endeavors. Um, so just to give a sense of what uh, um, the, the pairing system looks like is um, if you are interested, and we'll share the link in just a moment, um, we are always more than happy to have our enrollment advisors um, speak with you and get to know you a little bit more so that we can pair you very thoughtfully with your tutor. And then, um, as I said, your, your tutoring sessions will sort of look like however is going to be the best support for you, um, whether that's uh, primarily question-based or content-based, often it's a mix of both. And then certainly we've, we've talked about feedback and, and that bi-directional feedback that we really value. Um, so I have included um, this code here, this QR code that you can use to book a meeting with one of our enrollment advisors. Um, and here it is again, and, and uh, I think now we'll get to the meat of uh, the, the questions. We have some wonderful questions that have already come in, and I, and I actually want to combine two questions to start, and I'm going to pose it to both of you. So one question that came in, I'm in an IM rotation currently, and I'm using AMBOSS solely for my question bank. Do I still need to use UWorld as an adjunct to AMBOSS? And then another similar question came through. What's unique about TrueLearn versus the other question banks we mentioned? Would we recommend some of these versus others for specific rotations, or is it all personal preference? And so I'd love to hear from both of you, Hannah and Daniel, sort of what, what was your approach to which QBank you used, and if you used mul multiple QBanks, um, in what capacity did you do that? So maybe we can start with you, Daniel. Yeah, so um, so I think what me and Hannah have in common is that we're both uh, osteopathic medical school graduates. Um, so we took shelf exams that are by the NBOME. They're, co they're called COMATs. So essentially, you know, there's, they're a little bit different than the NBMEs that some of the, you know, allopathic medical students will take. Um, so for those shelf exams, my approach was I would take, I would take, let's say for a standard four-week rotation, I would focus on doing 
all of as many or all of the UWorld questions during the first three-ish weeks of that rotation, and then uh, try to complete, let's say like, let's say if I was on pediatrics, I would do three, uh, I would do as many of the pediatrics UWorld questions in the first three weeks, and then I would take the final week and focus on the true learn um, and just kind of do as many as I could. I mean, I wouldn't always get to finish them, but I would do as many as possible. And I think that was a, that was a good approach for me because one, um, it was seeing a lot of the same concepts, you know, twice, right? So you see the same, you know, you can only ask a certain amount of things in a certain amount of ways, right? So, you know, you, there's classic questions for each rotation. So it's good to see them multiple times from multiple different perspectives. And two, the style of the COMAT, the, and the, the DO, you know, the osteopathic shelf exam, it is a little different from UWorld not drastically, but it is a little different. And so doing the true learn questions, which are kind of written to help emulate that style was kind of helpful for me to shift a little bit away from thinking about it in a more, again, from the UWorld way and now more into like the Comat way. Uh, Daniel basically took the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly how I studied. I would do UWorld and then in the last week, try to shift my focus to true learn to like emulate the style of question I was going to see. And there was a little bit more focus on OMM as well, which is something we get tested on in COMATS. Um, I would say if I wasn't a DO and I was an MD, I probably would have just done one QBank. And I think uh, an issue that we have is going from step one to step two. Step one, you're used to spreading yourself over these all these gold resources. Like I said before, Sketchy, Pathoma, UWorld, First Aid. Um, and, and that's a great thing to do. But I think in step two and shelf studying, it's a little bit more important to, again, understand why you're doing what you're doing, understand imaging modalities, diagnostic tests. Um, and if you spread yourself too thin over too many Q banks, then you might, you know, miss out on the finer details. I always tell my students, I'd rather have you do 20 high quality questions where you get a lot from the questions um, rather than do 100 questions and you see more, but you maybe don't understand it as well. And when you get a question that's going to test a situation you've never seen before, you can't really pick an answer because you don't understand the why of the answer. Um, so I think it's, it's better to maybe I, everybody's different. Everybody wants to see different styles of questions. I think for step two, level two shelf comat, it's almost better to just stick to one Q bank. Um, just, just so you can really get into the meat of the question and understand why you're doing what you're doing. Great. And I can also offer my own experience, um, having gone through the allopathic MD process. So I, I did not use TrueLearn. Um, I basically uh, used exclusively UWorld. Um, and the, the other thing I'll add is, is think about um, using these resources in a very tailored and specific way. So it's not like on your IM rotation, you need to do all of internal medicine AMBOSS and all of internal medicine UWorld, right? You can basically use your QBank, your initial QBank, as a way to identify where your strengths and where your areas of weakness. And so, um, for example, for our colleague who shared that um, he's doing uh, AMBOSS at the moment, you can look back at your AMBOSS performance and you can say, oh, wow, you know, I, I get almost every GI question right, but cardiology, I'm missing a lot of these EKGs. And then you can use that to sort of... Um, as a jumping ground to say, okay, so now I'm going to look into you world and use you world in a really tailored and focused way. And rather than doing um, GI questions in you world, I'm going to focus in on cardiology questions. I'd say the same thing goes just in terms of volume. So, you know, internal medicine is a very high volume rotation. There are hundreds and hundreds of questions, uh, no matter which QBank you're using. Other rotations like surgery, psychiatry, OBGYN, um, even pediatrics, there are fewer questions in those areas. And so you might find that in those, you have more time and more bandwidth to incorporate a second QBank. Um, I couldn't agree more though with, with what Hanna said, which is, you know, it's, it's better to focus on quality over quantity. So you choose one, um, you know, use it well, and then use any others if you have the bandwidth to support your studying. Um, another question just came through. Uh, what is your recommendation for a reasonable study schedule for a longitudinal clerkship? So maybe Hannah, I know you started speaking before. Um, maybe you can share in a little bit more detail. What is your approach to developing a study schedule? 
Um, so with every rotation I did, I love doing Anki and I love doing questions because again, I like to go into a rotation a little bit prepared and not go in completely blind. Um, so essentially what I would do is I, I personally did like finishing all the questions, but that's my own personal way of doing things. Um, that's not something you have to do. Um, I would look at how many Anki cards were related to the subject and how many days I had to study. And I would divvy up, you know, if there were 400 cards and I had 20 days, um, I was going to do X amount of cards per day um, to to make sure that I finished it at least a couple of days before um, my exam. Uh, in terms of the Q bank, I would kind of give myself a couple of days with the Anki. So I would have learned something and then I would start with the same process of their X amount of questions. I have X amount of days. Um, this is how many questions I have to get done per day. And this is a fluid schedule. You know, if I had a really long day where I stayed late and my goal was to do 20 questions a day, it might be a five question day. It might be a no question day because realistically, I wanted to make the most out of my questions. Um, I think something a lot of students can fall into is busy work where you get questions done and you feel accomplished because you're like, yes, I did like 40 questions today. I did a good job. But what mattered to me was the quality of question again. Did I do only five questions but get a lot out of that five questions? Or did I do 20 questions but really learn nothing? And I've just, you know, wasted time that I could have been relaxing a little bit. So I'd be a, a little more prepared for the next day to focus on studying. Um, between that, I think I was always ready for my shelf exams. And again, you know, it's it's not about the percent correct you're getting. It's about what you're learning. And you can always do, uh, you know, all your wrong questions at the end to see that you've learned something or do a, a quick test of yourself with the questions left. Am I scoring like 75% or greater? I'm probably ready to take the shelf. Um, I do know for the DOs out there, um, the COMAT, the NBOME, uh, sends out sample, or you can look up sample questions for the uh, COMATs, which I always did, because one, it was questions I'd never seen before that were going to be represented on the COMAT. And two, sometimes those questions would pop up on the actual COMAT, which was nice to just have an easy throw of like, I've already seen this question before. Great. Thank you, Hannah. Any other thoughts on your end, Daniel, about uh, study schedule? I think those are, I mean, I, I think that's, Again, I think me and Hana had very similar experiences. So um, I think she captured um, basically everything that I did as far as making a study. I mean, I think I think one thing that I will say, and you know, it's it's a it's a plug for working with med school coach. I think that you know, if if, if you have trouble developing a study plan, I think that you know, working with a with a tutor is 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 exactly the big value. I think a lot of the time, it's not you know, it's not necessarily just about learning question strategy or or the or you know or learning the material a lot of the time it's just having someone to bounce ideas off of like okay i'm on a really light rotation how do and i have like surgery next how do i maximize the next four weeks before i know my life is going to be extremely busy right like should i be going ahead into surgery how should i approach prepping ahead for one rotation while being on a lighter current rotation right a lot of that strategy and study planning and just like Asking those kinds of questions and bouncing that I, those kinds of conversations is, I think, some of the biggest value that I've been able to provide to clients over the last couple of years. And so, um, I think you know, if if you're having trouble with that, I, I would say it's you know, it's 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 a it's it's a good, it's a very big part of what we do. You know, as far as being tutors, it's not just teaching uh, and strategy. A lot of it is answering those exact kind of questions. Great. I couldn't agree more. Um, and a follow-up question came through about longitudinal clerkships, um, where it's not standard rotations. It's more about tests that are distributed throughout the last six months. Um, that's certainly a unique circumstance. Um, and I think would require, as we're saying, sort of a more personalized um, study schedule. Although I will say um, that this really highlights the importance of the spaced repetition, right? For example, if you are um, rotating through OBGYN, in October 2023, and you won't be seeing that shelf exam until even October 2024, right, then it's really helpful to have um, some resource that gets at space repetition. So you'll continually see some aspects of that content moving through over the, the coming months. Um, 
any other questions um, that come in, we welcome you to submit them in the chat. Um, I'll just ask another question um, to you both because this hasn't quite come up yet, but I think one thing um, that is so important in clinical rotations, we've talked about attitude and eagerness and enthusiasm, um, and something else often comes up, which is this concept of ownership over your patients. And I'm curious what that means to both of you, and, and how would you recommend that um, rotating medical students demonstrate ownership for the patients that they're caring for and ownership um, and leadership in their in their clinical rotations. It can start with you, Daniel. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, I mean, I think ownership is just imagining that you are the end-all be-all provider of care for this person in front of you, right? So, um, you know, if the ball, like imagine that there is no resident or attending and I know it's hard because obviously as a medical student, you're not going to have necessarily all of the skills, knowledge, et cetera. But that is, in my opinion, ownership is like doing as much as you can with safely and within reason um, to care for patients, right? So not just like, you know, if you're just tasked with like a small task to go and, you know, help with lab work or, you know, get blood draws or whatever, um, you know, I think you should know about you know, just knowing about who is the patient you're going to see, you're like, why, why are they in the hospital, right? What are they getting treated for? What kind of labs are we drawing? Why are we drawing them, right? What, what is the, why do, why do these things matter, right? And so having that kind of thorough understanding, I think it matters even more once you go into your fourth year and you're actually kind of managing patients, like, you know, from start to finish, right? So I'll give you an example with interventional radiology, which is basically functions like a surgical service. You know, if you're going into a procedure, you should know why that person is on the operative table, right? I mean, you shouldn't, you know, we have like almost like an unspoken rule. Like you really, you really shouldn't be scrubbing unless you, unless you know about the case well enough to have booked it yourself, right? I mean, you should know why the patient's there. What are we treating? What's the approach, right? What's the approach for the procedure we're about to do? What are the indications, the contraindications? What are the patient's preoperative lab works? Um, and, you know, what are we expecting to do with this patient when we're done with the procedure, right? So that's kind of, in a nutshell, you know, what you should know for every patient on the board for the day on a surgical service, you know, that's that's what's expected of, you know, the sub eye. Um, and so if you're doing that as the third year level, I think people will be extremely impressed. You know, I don't think this is done often nearly enough by, by, by students. And so I think if you're taking that kind of initiative, it's, it's all, almost always going to go noticed, you know, very positively. Yeah. Um, for me, taking ownership is, you know, developing a relationship with the patient because you have a little bit more time to do that. You know, residents are busy, attendings are, bit, are busy, but, you know, you have one or two patients that you're following. So you have the time to take a really thorough history, a really uh, good physical exam, um, address the patient's concerns and needs, uh, give them updates when you can, and to double check that everything that should be done is being done. Um, you know, we're all human beings. Sometimes we miss an order. Sometimes we miss something that's going on with the patient. And and you can be that person who's like, hey, I'm noticing that this patient is, you know, um, very uncomfortable in bed. Is there maybe something we could do to address their pain needs or like um, get them an extra pillow even as, as something as, as small as that? It makes a, a world of difference in the patient's stay at the hospital. And it shows me that you're really in tune with like um, taking care of somebody and caring for them beyond just their medical needs. Um, it's also really helpful, you know, to, to have that extra backup of, hey, we discussed taking this lab and I see that it wasn't ordered. Did you get a chance to order that? Because maybe I forgot. Maybe it's something I wasn't thinking about. And it shows me that you're still thinking about the patient and the diagnosis and the management as well. Um, I also like to have my medical students call consults because I think it's a great way to show that you understand what's going on with the patient and it's great practice for when you're a resident because it's scary to call a consult. Um, it teaches you the great skill of like summing up the patient in a very concise way. Um, advocating for why we're doing what we're doing. Why are you calling this cardiology consult? If you call them and say, well, because my resident said to, not a great start. But if you have an understanding of like, I'm doing this because they're in atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response and we can't control it with medication, what would you recommend? It shows me you have a great understanding of the patient. Um, you're actively working to improve their um, medical 
uh, care and um, I can rely on you to advocate for the patient when the cardiologist maybe says, why are we doing this? Or why, what do you think we should be doing to improve their AFib with RBR? Great. Well, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Just to recap, um, we covered a lot of ground tonight, and I know it's just the beginning, but hopefully we help to share some helpful pearls about uh, succeeding in your clinical rotations um, from thinking about preparation prior to the rotation and the type of um, information gathering and content learning that you'll try and get done ahead of time to um, planning your study schedule, right? Keeping yourself accountable, managing your different resources that will hopefully fall into the different categories that we discussed. Um, so, so, so importantly, right, being present, being active, being engaged, thoughtful, helpful, being an advocate for your patients, being a voice for your patients so that all your team members see that you are uh, taking ownership. Um, again, we'll, we'll keep this uh, screen up for just another moment, which um, is a QR code for you to book a meeting with one of our enrollment advisors. Um, thank you all for joining us. We wish you the absolute best of luck in your rotations, and hopefully we have the opportunity to work with you. Take care. <laughs>